Hello and welcome to the University of Tasmania at the Cradle Coast campus in northwest Tasmania. Today we're going to show you a special film that we made as part of our presentation for National Science Week. We're going to delve behind the scenes, we're going to look at how traditional papermaking has informed commercial papermaking practices and explore what the science behind those practices are. We hope that you and your teachers enjoy the show. All right, well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Joanna Gare, and I look after the university's arts and public programs for community learning. Um, this isn't what I normally do as part of my job, but I really, really wanted to do this for Science Week as an opportunity to talk about Bernie's industrial heritage. Um, even though we no longer have Australia's largest paper mill operating at the moment, we can still have those conversations and honour our um, our papermaking heritage. I would love to introduce you to two very, very special people who have come today. We've got Zach from Forico. Um, Zach. And we've got Jason Smith, who's come all the way from Hobart for us, who is a, uh, an associate professor of chemistry from the University of Tasmania. Now, Zach, you're a fibre chemist. Is that a good, is that a good definition? Uh, I'm a laboratory technician and a chemist, so the chemistry is majority on uh, wood chips. Mm -hmm. So we get the eucalyptus fiber from Tasmanian growing trees. So chemistry in terms of chemicals, yes. yes. Fiber, not so much. Okay, but, but you do make paper, we do make paper as part of paper. your experiments yeah. and yeah. Um, that was based off the um, meal at AWPM here. So it is has a similarity. So there, there's a lot of synergy there. There is. And for those of you that know a little bit of the history of eucalyptus paper in Burnie, uh, Charles Turner, who is a proud Burnie man, uh, was a chemist based at APP. I mean, he was the one that did a lot of the early experiments of eucalyptus to first work out how eucalyptus can be turned into a decent pulp for paper making. Jason, you're an associate professor of chemistry. Correct. And what is your relationship to pulp and paper? I have a very tenuous uh, link to Excellent. pulp and paper. Uh, my background is an organic chemist, and so normally I'm looking at um, trying to make new molecules or, or discover new molecules around drugs and sometimes new materials. And I'm starting to come into paper as we're trying to make, take paper or paper-based products to make uh, bioplastics. So instead of little plasticky things that we like to wrap our things up in, we can start to replace that with some paper-based products. Of course, we know paper and plastic are two very different things. So we're trying to develop some chemistry um, to make paper a bit more plastic-like. So at the end, instead of putting it in the landfill, you can put it into your compost garden and just dissolve away basically and um, be recycled that way. So. Um, Jason, before we kick off, can you please give the audience an indication of what is chemistry? What's chemistry? And it's as simple as chemistry is everything. Um, be it all the materials we've got, the clothes in our backs, on our feet, the food we eat. We often don't think about that. We often think chemicals nasty. We are all chemicals. Um, everything is chemicals. So the biology is actually based purely on chemistry. Um, you know, the food we eat literally is chemical fuel to burn us through, to, you know, lots of chemical reactions in there. And I guess the chemistry, we don't think about these things because they just happen. Usually we study the things that don't happen, basically. We often know more about things that happen unnaturally or that we force to happen rather than things that occur naturally. And I guess chemistry is very broad from materials through to iPhones, etc and our lovely big LCD screens and the chemistry that goes into it. We think of it more about electronics, but it's actually the chemistry that's at the heart of that, if you like. Um, through to the other space that we're into is drug discovery. And obviously, we're talking about plants. Mm. Um, our entire pharmaceutical industry was, was born from plants and native medicines and you know, written down is the traditional Chinese medicines and Indian medicines and various other cultures as well. And really, it's been formulating that um, those plant-based medicines into what we've got these days as our, mm. our modern pharmaceutical industry. Uh, a lot of it hasn't changed. The difference is now we can actually make molecules from 
simple building blocks, just like we can start from a single brick and make a house, we can start from smaller molecules and make much more complex molecules um, that are fit for purpose. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. I mean, good is probably a, maybe an anti-cancer medication. Bad might be some kind of thing like a pollutant. So it's, it's very broad. So chemistry can be everything from simply how do things work, what are things made of, through to various physical properties, um, mechanical properties as well, and the chemistry behind, or which now gets down to the bonding, how things are put together, and how does that affect the mechanical properties, if you like. So, paper making in many ways is about taking something in nature, much like with the drug research, breaking it down and reassembling it in, in a new way. So, for example, here we've got a cotton knoll that comes off the the raw cotton uh, plant. So that's cotton in its natural form. Then we can make rag out of it, or fabric out of it, so that's just little pieces of cotton rag. And there it is after it's been in my Hollander beater, which is my little pulper there. There it is after about six hours of beating. So you can see, these are all different examples of different plants that can turn uh, from, from its natural form into a pulp. What I brought in today is essentially cotton. So that, those, three uh, those three examples here are exactly what I've got in here. So I'm going to turn the machine on for a second just because it's noisy and fun and kids love that kind of thing. And let's be honest, adults do too. And you are welcome to come and have a look. Okay. going round. Okay. All right. So I should probably tell you a little bit about what a Hollander beater is. Back in the day, they, they reckon there's a little bit of, um, not everyone agrees with this story, but the story goes that in first century China, there was a court uh, official called Sao Lun, who was wanting to find a new way or creating a writing material. So back in the day, they used to use clay slabs or stone, both very unwieldy or wood, also quite unwieldy. Imagine signing a book made out of stone. It would just be ridiculous to carry around. And so he was looking at the way that fishing nets were drying on the beach one day and how the seaweeds were sticking to them and drying on them and realised that there was a surface that he could make. So he set to boiling all of these um, scraps so old fishing nets, old ropes, old bits of textile, old bits of plant fibre. And he, he worked out a way, his, his, um, the emperor was his, uh, I suppose you'd say, um, patron. And together they, they developed how to make paper in the first century. Now that technology was very closely guarded, so much so that um, the paper makers of the court were closely guarded themselves, that they were kept in a a walled environment and they weren't allowed to share that knowledge with anybody. But one day, some Arab spice traders coming through China, they stole some paper makers and they tortured them until they told them the secret. Um, some stories go that they beat them on their feet until they released their secret and they kept them prisoner until they got the secret of how to make paper. And then as they're traveling around the spice route, which obviously, you know, China, you've got um, Middle East, and you come up through Europe, they were trading paper making as a new technology. So it's very enterprising. In the 1680s, the Dutch went, oh, okay, we don't have much in the way of river structures here, so we can't power a water wheel. So they invented this, and this gets us back to the Hollander beta. That's why it's called a Hollander. So the Dutch went, okay, we don't, have, uh, we don't have those incredible structures for the water wheel to push over, so we will create a way of recycling the same water. So you see how this goes round? That's got teeth on it, and it sits into a bed where the teeth are set at another level. Because under the microscope, cotton is incredibly long under the microscope, and so is, um, so is flax. Um, so to, the, the cotton I've got in here is, is a fairly straightforward, just pure rag paper, but I've made a batch of flax pulp for you too, which I'll beat up in just a second for you. But the rule of thumb is, here's some flax from our garden actually, any plant that is challenging to cut on the horizontal, like if it's really hard to get in there, 
you're going to have those lovely long strands and the, the, the length of that is retained using Honda Beta because we're not cutting the fibre, we're macerating it. So we, we keep those long fibres, um, which means that we can create very, very thin and still strong papers. So I'm going to show you what it's like to make a sheet of paper. So I have some cotton paper in here. This is called a mould and a decal. This is the decal. This is the mould. Decal from the German word Dechschul, cover two together into the vat. Now, I call this a sugar, but that's because I lived a long time in Scotland. This is one of those aspects that literally it's just a dispersion mm. in this instance, so you're not getting the clumping because you've got your, uh, your fibres suspended in your water and the fibres eventually going to try and hold together and, and what we call hydrogen bonding together because mm. the fibres have got hydrogen OH bonds on them and that's what's going to hold them together. Water is an OH bonds. And so that's what's the suspension. So you're going to try and even all that out and then eventually that water is going to flow out of there and the fibres are going to come together and stick together. Not quite like glue, but a little bit like glue. Yeah. It's pretty weak glue, but it's strong enough. Yeah. So there's our sheet of paper. At the moment, it's just a bunch of fibres hanging out together, really, isn't it? It's not really paper. Um, but what we're going to do now is to couch or coucher, to lie down, there's another European word being used, onto a piece of woolen felt. Okay, now, I know you can't see that bit, but that's where it's ended up. So I've transferred it from my mould onto my post. And so a post is essentially a big sandwich of wet paper and felt. And we make a gigantic one of those before we then put it into a press. Now, given how heavy presses are, I wasn't able to bring one with me today. So please use your imaginations on that one.